let's take our Bibles and turn together to Nehemiah chapter 2. My text is from verse 17 down to verse 20. And I want to speak with you about God's work revealed. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verses 17 to 20. We know that God is always at work. He's directing all things. All things come from his hand. Whether in creation, whether in providence, his good providence, whether in salvation, or even in judgment. And we may not always see how it is that God is working. In fact, we can't tell one second from now what God has willed and purposed. But looking back, we can see that his sovereign will has traced the path of everything that comes to pass. I know there's a way that people talk today saying, well, God's in control of all things. But that's not even a word that you find in Scripture. No, he directs all things. And all things are from his hand. Now, looking forward, as I said, we don't know one second from now what God has purposed. But looking forward, we do so with some assurance that whatever he has purposed, that it will come to pass exactly as he has purposed. In his time, in his way, and according to his direction. And that's really the story here in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verses 17 to 20, which is my text. Remember, the Lord had directed Nehemiah. He'd been the cupbearer up there in Persia and now had come traveled all these miles, inspected the city and the walls, and seen the destruction of the city and the walls. What in Jeremiah's day was still to happen, now we're actually 150 years after that had already taken place. And the Lord had raised up Cyrus, a wicked king, and caused a remnant to come back into the land. And the temple was re rebuilt, but the walls were still in ruin. And when he came and inspected the city, he saw firsthand that it was exactly as had been told him. Exactly as had been related. It says there in verse 17. Remember, he went at night and observed these things. When he first showed up, all that was said of him that we saw last time in verse 10, there was come a man. And I related that to a parallel with the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came to this earth, there was come a man. But people had all kinds of commentary about him, who he was and why he'd come. Still today, it's the same thing. People debate this. And yet, to know there was come a man with a purpose. Nehemiah is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ coming and observing the broken down gates and the walls consumed with fire, that's a picture of God's judgment and condemnation under which even those that are God's elect stood until such time as Christ accomplished the work at Calvary. They were under the condemnation of the law, fallen in Adam. And so these ruined walls burnt with fire, it says there in verse 17 of Nehemiah 2, then said I unto them, well, he first gathered the rulers. It says in verse 16, the rulers knew not whither I went and what I did. It's like when Christ came, the rulers didn't know who he was. They were anticipating a Messiah, but not this one, not a Jesus of Nazareth. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But he said, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews. That's why I entitled this particular study, God's Work Revealed. Because there's nobody that is going to know 
the work of God in the Lord Jesus Christ apart from it being revealed. Here, Nehemiah said, Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews. Our Lord Jesus Christ was on this earth for almost 30 years before he manifests himself publicly to Israel. And some say, well, why 30 years? What's significant about that number? Well, under the Old Testament law, 30 years, that was the age in which priests enter into the ministry. Why did Christ come into this world? To be that high priest under the Lord. Not to offer the sacrifice of bulls and goats, but offer his own blood, shed his own blood. And so he entered into that ministry as the Lamb of God at 30 years of age. Not much is said of the Lord Jesus Christ during his childhood or his upbringing. We have a few examples, but as far as the full manifestation to the nation of Israel, it was not until that time when he was baptized by John and the Spirit descended like a dove. That's the anointing. This demonstrated he was the anointed one. Well, this is what was taking place here with Nehemiah. That neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them. So here we're seeing God's work revealed. Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. He says, Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. That word's a key word even with regard to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ where he took upon himself the reproach of sinners. And the reproach here was that here was this city in ruins. Yes, the temple had been rebuilt. And yet the enemies use it to mock that city, to say, well, where's their God? And he says, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Now, that wall of Jerusalem had to be rebuilt historically for a time until the Lord Jesus Christ should come and fulfill all things that pertained to Sinners for whom he came to save, but when he finished the work, then there was no more reason even for this city to exist. And that's why in 70 AD, the Lord raised up, just like he raised up Babylon to destroy this city the first time, so he raised up the Roman army to come and destroy that city the final time. Yes, you can go over to Jerusalem today and you can see the old city, you can see the new you can see different sites that have been marked out as to where Christ walked when he was on this earth. But as far as any spiritual significance is concerned with regard to the city of Jerusalem, there's no more significance. Why? Because there is that new Jerusalem. There's that wall that Christ came to build, which is the wall of salvation. And his Jerusalem, Paul wrote to the Galatians, is from above. It's not on this earth. People keep looking over there today to speculate and to try to discern the tea leaves, so to speak, as far as Christ's return. And they're looking at natural Israel. There's no more purpose that God has for natural Israel other than that there may be still some elect among them that Christ came and paid their sin debt and them also Christ must bring. Paul said that. He knew that God had not completely cast off his people that he foreknew. That's the key. Those that he foreknew because he was a, an Israelite of Israelites. Tribe of Benjamin. And yet the, it pleased the Lord to reveal Christ in him. But that's the only reason that that nation exists today like any nation. Why does it still exist? Because God still has a people that he's going to call out. But he's going to save them the same way he's ever saved any sinner. It's going to be through the bloodshed of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no favored nations. There's no favored sons. It has always bothered me when you've got 
people today that say they're Christians and any time that someone in Palestine or up in uh, Syria or Egypt, they, they get bombed and killed, people are thinking thumbs up. And then when it happens to a Jew or the land of Israel, all of a sudden they're saying, oh no, we can't have that. We gotta protect them. And they've misinterpreted what God said to Abraham that in his seed would all the nations of the earth be blessed. Paul said there in Galatians chapter 3, if you've never read Galatians 3, go read Galatians 3. It's not part of this message, but in verse 16, he said that when that promise was made, it was not to seeds as if many, but to one seed, which is Christ. That's the seed of Abraham. And in that seed, even Christ said, of that sheepfold of Jews in John 10, yes, he had those that he came to call out, but what did he say? Other sheep I have who are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. He was talking about Gentiles. And if we're a Gentile today, which as far as I know, last time I traced my roots back, I'm pure German bred. I don't have any actual natural Jewish blood in me that I, I can trace other than maybe going back to you know Adam and through Adam, Noah, etc. But even there I'm not a son of Shem I'm a son of Japheth. That's the Europeans that came from that seed. And yet here I am. You say well how can you even have any hope of thinking that you're one of the Lord's? Well he promised a, a seed in Christ for whom Christ died of every tribe, nation, and tongue. That's a glorious thing. So here, in this instance, God purposed that Jerusalem should no longer be a reproach. It had, lied, it had laid in waste, like I said, for 150 years. And now, of a sudden, appears this Nehemiah who's going to lead the way and raise up the walls once again. This is God's work revealed in his time, in his way. And so, verse 18, Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me. When we're looking at Nehemiah as a type of Christ, how the hand of his father was upon him to accomplish that work that he came to do. Unlike any other. The Spirit of God was given him without measure. But here again, Nehemiah is a type in this. And he gives the glory to God, just like Christ in all he did gave the glory always to his Father. When people questioned him by what authority he did what he did. As also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. So Nehemiah here as the scriptures say, let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Well, here's one witness is the hand of God. That's the spirit of God upon him. And the second witness was the testimony of a pagan king. Remember, he came with the authority of letters from a pagan king that he ought to go and rebuild this city. Also, the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. That was a response. When it had been revealed what it was his work was to accomplish, then we can see here the Lord gathering around him a people that would rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for this good work. Where we see the word good, like I said in English, it's a derivative of the word God. Let us rise up and build so they strengthen their hands for this God work <laughs> would be a way of reading that. So here again we see God's work revealed in his time and even in the drawing out of a people that to that point those walls had been in ruin for some time. People were living all around it trying to make it go of it. But the enemies abounded and now appears in Nehemiah and raises it up. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and 
Geshem, the Arabian, heard it. It says they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them. And again, I love this, is Nehemiah is the mediator here. Here was the opposition, here was the scorn, here was the despising, and yet who answered? It was Nehemiah. It's like anybody that has anything to say against one of the lords today, who is our advocate? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Then answered I them and said unto them, I love this. See how often this is repeated? The God of heaven. When that says the God of heaven, that word God means omnipotent, potentate, the chief magistrate of heaven. That means that, yes, he's in heaven, but he directs all things. There's not one thing that occurs or takes place on this earth but what comes from his command. And he says, he will prosper us. How can Nehemiah make that statement? Well, it's God that's saying. And I see again a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ here. When he came to this earth, he didn't come to attempt salvation. When uh, the angel said to Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. He shall save his people. There's that people that he came to save and that salvation would prosper in his hand. That's what Isaiah wrote about Christ there in Isaiah chapter 53. That by his knowledge, he would justify men. He would justify his people. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. See, that's the spirit of God at work. As they identified with Nehemiah, they joined him in that cause. This is the picture of what Christ said. Unless a man take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Don't say that you're the Lord's and yet when the Lord has raised up this representative, then you sit idly by. No, they said, therefore, we his servants will arise and build. Whose servants? God's servants. That's really who we all are. We're God's servants to accomplish his work in his time and his way. I know the world doesn't perceive it that way, but even unconverted sinners are God's servants. That there's not anybody that lives or breathes or moves, but what they accomplish God's will in some way, either for salvation or for condemnation. Get down right to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those priests that offered up the Lord Jesus Christ and crucified him, they were God's servants to offer up his lamb. They didn't acknowledge it, nor would they. They thought they were ridding themselves from some imposter, but here they were the priests offering up God's lamb, all the while doing their will and yet accomplishing the will of God. Such is God's work. But it's not for everybody. Because you see here at the end of verse 20, Nehemiah was not under any delusion that somehow everybody would rally behind him. Like some say, well, if we can just get more people to side with Jesus, we could get a lot more done. That's not how his work is revealed. That's not how it's done. Notice here, Nehemiah says, but you have no portion. So there are those for whom he came and these would be drawn by the Spirit of God and by this work, the work finished and building the wall. But you, so that means there was a divide here, have no portion nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. Not in this one. It's like so many today. They might profess to be the Lord's and yet they have no portion, no right or memorial in Jerusalem. But you see, from all eternity, that's what we read in Scripture. God purposed that our world should be a stage on which he would display and manifest his grace and wisdom in the redemption of lost sinners. That's why this world exists. Did you know that? He created for the glory of Christ. 
and the whole purpose in the fall of man. People say, well, why did God allow the fall? God not only allowed it, he ordained it because had there been no fall, there would be no salvation. Had there been no sin, there would be no grace. And so this is the stage in this world on which God, who is the director, causes people to pass across this stage and calls them as he will to the degree that even the principalities and powers that exist, whether it's angels or demons, they all serve the purpose of God and the glory of Jesus Christ. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. I can't emphasize this enough. There's no mistakes with God. Even here, reading about the walls lying in ruin, the picture of the fall. But all that God purpose that at this point in time would be revealed this one, Nehemiah, who would be the deliverer. In Ephesians chapter 3, notice here in verse 8, Paul talks about his own state. He says, unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Ephesians 3, 8. Who are the saints? Those are the ones that have been sanctified and justified in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? Yes, there were those Jews to whom the Lord sent his disciples to preach, but Paul specifically to the Gentiles, to the nations. These that the Jews looked upon as dogs. But God purposed all along that there would be those for whom Christ would pay the debt. And to make, verse 9, all men see. And where you see the word all men see, it's in the sense of the ethnic sense. All kinds of men would be the way to read that. Because it's clear not all, every single person sees, but May all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So even here, you see God's sovereign in creation. He's sovereign in providence. And he's sovereign in salvation. All that's summed up in this word here. But what was the mystery? The mystery was that all along, even though God began this history with Israel, yet the mystery was that God all along had created this world so that Jew and Gentile would be, that's why it's called the fellowship of the ministry. But now that Christ has come, there's no more Jew or Gentile, bond or free. Preachers that are saying, well, God still has a special program for natural Israel. And when this is all done working with the Gentiles, then Christ is going to come back and then he's going to start working with the Jewish nation again. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. I challenge you to, to show me one Scripture where that's declared. No, the mystery is, the fellowship is that when Christ came, that he united in one. That's what Ephesians 2 is all about. Of two, he made one man. That's describing the church. Having broken down the middle wall of partition and we're going to see that even here in Nehemiah as we go along it wasn't just Jews that were were drawn to help build this wall but there were others of other ethnic backgrounds that the Lord drew behind Nehemiah and they built that wall because they were made to see that that wall that city represented something greater than themselves it represented a work that when the Lord Jesus Christ would come, he would accomplish. But verse 10, he see, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places, whatever they may be, angels or demons, I don't care. It says here might be known how by the church that saved, redeemed, justified people, Jew and Gentile, the manifold wisdom of God according to what? The eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So 
when we talk about God's work being revealed and the unfolding of it, it's over time that we see how it is that what God had always purposed from before the foundation of the world now is unfolding. And if this world still exists as it does, it must be then that there are still sinners for whom Christ paid the debt and Christ is not coming again until that very last one is brought to him. If you wonder, well, why, why is he delaying? How can it get any worse? That's what every generation's ever thought. How can it get any worse? How can it be any worse than we just read in Jeremiah where God said he's going to destroy that city and the bodies would be lying out in fields and birds of prey would come and eat them. You think, wow, that's pretty, well, that's already happened. Shouldn't surprise us as we see other things that the Lord brings devastation and people get all religious and continue to try to find some comfort from their false preachers and leaders like one man said recently, well, God wouldn't do this, not a God of love. That's misleading the people rather than seeing God's hand in everything that takes place. He's soft. He's just in all he does. But all things are subjugated to his eternal purpose. So coming back here to my text, let me just give you a few points to wrap this up concerning God's work revealed. First of all, in Nehemiah 2 and verses 17 to 18, God's work revealed through his representative. His representative. Who was his representative here? It was Nehemiah. When he met with the leaders of Jerusalem, this distress that they were in. This is over a hundred year problem. That's a lot, long time when, when you think about ruins. And uh, possibly everybody sitting around looking at it perhaps thought that it would never be fixed. And it wasn't until such time as the Lord raised up Nehemiah. And I look at that with regard to the fall and the condition of this world under the fall. There's nothing man could do to fix it. And down through the years, the promised seed did not come immediately. From the beginning of that seed being announced in the garden, many thousands of years went by before Christ actually appeared. Everything to that point was in type and picture and prophecy. And some say, well, why so long? How come all that time. But God purposed it all along. I asked somebody that the other day. If you were starting to keep track of time, wouldn't you start at one and then start going up to 4,000, 5,000 years? It's amazing in the calendar of time that it started back, and there's a debate as to when it all began, 5,000, 6,000 years prior. But what is evident is as you're studying through history, it's going down to zero. Who set that in motion? It must be that God had a purpose because when it got down to zero, what happened? Then they started counting up one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to where we are 2021 today. But who ordained that so that when you sit down and even the secular world divides before Christ and after Christ. They, they say now we're in the year of our Lord. Well, we were in the year of our Lord before he came. But it just shows that all of this was according to God's purpose. And that it wasn't fully revealed until such time. It's like Nehemiah here. When he came and he instructed the people as to why he was there as God's representative. Then there was some understanding. And I say the same thing when we study and see how it is that God purposed that Christ should come. And when he by his spirit is pleased to reveal in us who he is and why he came and what he accomplished, which is the gospel, then those that are taught of him can fully understand. Over in Luke chapter 1, you see Zechariah even. This was 
John the Baptist's father, when uh, it was revealed unto him that John the Baptist would be that forerunner, and uh, when he was enabled then to speak again, because you remember that the angel struck him with, with dumbness because he questioned how it was that his child should be called John, and the Lord said, well, until it comes to pass that your, your tongue is going to be dumb, but then when the child was born, John was born, and they asked him, what should they call him? And he wrote it down in, in Luke 1, 63. His name is John. They all marveled. That was when his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loose, and he spake and praised God. And they wondered at that. Well, there again, it's God's work unfolding, how he revealed himself. And you can read here in Luke 1, 67, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Well, that goes back thousands of years. God had promised to seed David. Now was the revelation. Just like Nehemiah. This was not some whim that just happened where he went to Jerusalem at this time. It was exactly at the time God purposed. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. To perform what? The mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. All this is a picture of Nehemiah as a type and representative that God's purpose should come at that time for that purpose to redeem this, deliver this people out of the hand of the enemies. But all is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's how God's work is revealed. It's through his representative. Nehemiah was a type, but Christ is the fulfillment. Secondly, coming back here, that God's work is revealed in calling out a remnant. Nehemiah didn't come down here on his own and try to rally some troops and see what he could do. No. There again, even those that should join with him was purposed of God. That's why we saw already here the distress that we are in is the term that is used there in verse 17, ye see the distress that we are in. What's interesting to me is Nehemiah identifies with their distress. He didn't say the distress that you were in, but that we are in. Stop and think about why Christ came. He came to be numbered among transgressors and identified with their distress. And so he declares himself to be one with them for the purpose of delivering them. Now, when Christ identified with sinners, he didn't become a sinner, but he came to bear their sin. And so I see this even with Nehemiah and the Lord purposing this, identifying with them that he might call out this remnant. It wasn't everybody, as we saw there in verse 20. There were those that the Lord purposed should rise up and build, but there were others, he said, you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. A lot of people have difficulty with that with regard to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They want him to be everybody's friend, everybody's savior. They ought to give everybody a chance is the way they put it. Well, guess what? Salvation is not by chance. It's according to the will of God. And as he says there in verse 18, the hand of my God, which is good upon me. That's how our Lord defended everything that he did while he was on this earth, even in the face of, of the opposition of those that saw him, was that God's hand was upon him. And we know to such a degree that they could not do one thing more or less than what God had ordained. And so... We see God's work revealed even in those that he was pleased to call out through the work of this representative. But thirdly, 
Here we see God's work revealed by bringing to pass exactly what he said. There's no woulda, coulda, shoulda with God. If, if only, Nehemiah, you'd gotten here earlier, maybe things would not be the way they are. No, he got there exactly when God purposed. And that nothing about this, even though it was impossible, like I said, it sat for hundreds of years in ruin. But at this time, suddenly now, we find people rallying behind him. And verse 18, they said, let us rise up and build. You know, where Nehemiah had called them to rise up and build. In verse 17, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem. Then they said, let us rise up and build. That's where you see the effect of the work of God. That's how it's revealed. How do you know God's at work? Well, where you see those to whom the gospel is preached now coming out of darkness and being drawn to Christ and his work that he came to do on this earth and through his church. That's where you see the, the hand of God revealed. But I'll tell you, there's some times where you might preach for a while and never see anything. See, that's what's wrong with preachers today. They're always trying to make something happen. <laughs> and so they, they try to twist arms or persuade people to try to get to work. We've all lived under that kind of preaching before, haven't we? What I call the ten-prong whip, where the preacher's just coming down on you. You need to give more. You need to be more. You need to be witnessing more. That's not the work of God. When you, when you see people reason like that, that's... I don't find Nehemiah doing any of that here. He simply declared why it is he had gone and looked to his God to bless and to raise up those who should identify with him in this work. And so it is that God reveals his work. It's his sovereign hand bringing to pass all that he has purposed. I don't know about you, but I find comfort in that. Where Christ said, my sheep hear my voice and they will follow me. It's not the preacher's job to drive them to Christ or like some preachers say, you've got to win them to Christ. No, that's not, we don't win souls. Christ has saved souls by his death and he draws them as he will. But fourthly here, God's work is revealed even in the midst of the most intense opposition of men. It's interesting that as soon as he declared his purpose for being there in verse 19, all of a sudden there were two particular leaders, Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite. And then it says in Geshem and Geshem the Arabian. So these were people that did not want to see this wall being rebuilt and certainly didn't want to give the glory to Nehemiah. And what does it say? They laughed us to scorn and despised us. Isn't that what they did with our Lord Jesus Christ? When he declared what it is his work was to do to come save sinners, they mocked him, they scorned him. Even when they hung him on the cross, they said he saved others, let him save himself. He was a mockery and a, and a, a scorning of, of people that opposed him, that didn't know who he was. And yet, all the while, God had purposed it through that very death that salvation should be accomplished. These first two were mentioned over in, in verse 10. We saw that last time. Then Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite heard of it. And it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. No one wants to hear about a, a successful Savior, one who has come to redeem his people. They want it to be somebody that they determined how it is that sinners will be saved. Tobiah is a Jewish name and likely a man of influence that was associated with the high priest's family because uh, he was one that gathered help from the priests later on against Nehemiah. Even though Tobiah is a good name, that means Jehovah is good, Tobiah. Jehovah is good. A strange name for somebody that was so opposed to the work of God, yet many times that's the way it is. Sanballat 
He was also connected by marriage to priestly families. When we get to Nehemiah chapter 13, we'll see that. And uh, so these were, these were Jews that were tied to the priests of the day and yet opposed to the work of God. Do you see how that is a type also of the Lord Jesus Christ? Where was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ planned? It was in the synagogues. It was in the temple. He wasn't out there in the streets. He was the friend of sinners. But these that promoted themselves were the ones that laughed our Lord to scorn and uh, rebelled against him. And yet, the final point I'd bring out here is that God's work revealed cannot be thwarted. When God sets in motion what he's purposed to accomplish, there's nothing that can resist his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Even here, Nehemiah ignored their scorn like our Lord did. He was not moved by the scorn of men. Rather, he was bold in continuing forward, even in the face of that mocking. And when it came down to whether it was a matter of pleasing, like Nehemiah, pleasing men or, or God, he said again, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. I love that concerning even the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote about it in Romans 8. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, ascended on high. That's how God has purposed to reveal his work. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? And so we see even through this, the Lord raised up Nehemiah. He had this people that uh, would identify with him, and the walls would be rebuilt. And so they were. The rest of this book of Nehemiah has to do with how these walls were built with a sword and a trowel. In the one hand, they laid the concrete to build the walls. In the other hand, they fought with a sword. But nothing could hinder God from accomplishing his work. But all others that opposed, like Nehemiah told them, you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. And so it is with any that stand against the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the true Christ, the one who came to fulfill all righteousness and did it in his life and his death for his people. There's none that can stand against him and hope to, expect to, have God's favor. They are enemies and they'll die enemies. All right.